Five. Guys, welcome to the Startup Tank Climate Investor Pitch Show. If this is your first time, here's what you need to know. We're like Shark Tank for climate companies. We bring on the most promising climate uh, founders, investors, we try to get some deals done. Today, we have an incredible panel. I'll tell you a little bit more about the folks that we're having on. But first, just a quick roundup of us and what we do. So the Startup Tank, we're here to bring more innovation, funding, and collaboration into the climate tech ecosystem. We're all on Team Planet, I like to say, and that means we need to, uh, regardless of what side of the coin you come on, when it comes to the political spectrum, we've got a problem to solve. And these founders are all here solving big problems. I'm your host, Matt Ward. I'm the founder of the Startup Tank, as well as the investor and syndicate lead at Forward VC, our climate syndicate focused on early stage, so pre-seed and seed stage climate companies. To learn more about us and what we do, visit thestartuptank.com or forward.vc, the number four, ward.vc, respectively. But now, as we kick things off or we get into the program, I'd like to introduce our awesome investor panelists that I'm going to be joined by. First, we have, let's go with ladies first, Aurel Khalili with Capital Nature. We're actually recently co-invested on a, a super promising battery deal out of Israel that Aurel brought us, uh, Exion. Aurel, do you want to take the floor and share a little bit more about you and about Capital Nature? Yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's really an honor to be part of this panel. Um, a bit about me. My name is Aurel. I'm originally from New York and currently based out of Tel Aviv. Um, I manage all things deal flow at Capital Nature. We're uh, Israel's oldest climate-focused VC. I've uh, been around for over a decade, investing exclusively in climate tech across the board, aside from food tech. Um, we're deeply committed to all of our portfolio companies and are active in follow-on rounds. We have five companies that are public here on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Uh, we exclusively focus on early stage and love to co-invest with foreign VCs. As Matt mentioned, we recently closed uh, Forward's largest investment to date. So great things coming out of uh, out of Forward VC. And um, yeah, we're really happy to be here and happy to collaborate. And thanks for thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing. And hope hope we're going to be lucky enough to be co-investors with Ryan on another deal that we're looking at. Ryan with Generator. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about you and your program, Ryan? Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for having me on, Matt. Good to be here with you all. Uh, I am the managing director of the Generator Sustainability Accelerator. Generator is a ten-year-old fund and accelerator uh, based out of the Midwest. We have programs. Um, all over the world now. We've invested and supported over a thousand founders. Um, we've gone on to raise over a billion dollars in follow-on funding. Um, we work in small cohort sizes, so five to six companies per cohort. That allows us to be much more impactful and hands-on um, with, the, with the founders and the teams. Um, and my background, I've been on both sides of the table. So I started off at a $200 million fund here in Chicago uh, before starting three companies myself over the last 10 years. Uh, some success, some failure, um, learn from both. Um, and now applying that to help founders at the the forefront of our climate and environmental crisis. So we're really excited to be here, really excited to, to support you all and looking forward to hearing the pitches. And I'm super excited and looking forward to it and thrilled to have awesome investors like both of you on board. We, uh, we've we got some incredible companies lined up. Before we go further, I just want to let you all know that tonight's program or this morning, depending on where you're located, is brought to you by Leva. Leva is a digital SPV solution based here in Zurich, Switzerland. It's literally five minutes to set up. You can start an SPV, raise money, or deploy capital. Quick, fast, simple, easy. It doesn't matter if it's five investors or five million. You're raising 50K or 50 million, 500 million. Super fast, scalable, easy. You can do secondaries, follow on transactions, et cetera. To learn more and set up your free SPV, visit forward, the number forward.vc slash Leva, L-E-V-A, for more details and just tell them that Matt sent you. And speaking of Matt, I need to plug my own book, so to speak, one more time. This is Forward VC. We're bringing this all to you. If you're a founder that's looking to apply a pre-seed or a seed stage climate company that's really changing the world and doing big things, apply at the startuptank.com or visit us at forward.vc, the number forward.vc, to learn more about our climate syndicate of accredited investors that invest in the world's most promising climate companies. And those promising climate companies, that's who we have here now today. So now I want to transition things over to the actual program itself. We have six incredible companies on 
slate for you guys today. Recyc Recycly app, uh, Carbon Yield, Symbergy, Baru, Aqua Alarm, and BioESol. Each of the companies will have five minutes on the clock. We're rough on the timeline. And they'll get to pitch their company to investors here and to hundreds, maybe thousands at this point, tuning in worldwide. People focused on climate, people focused on investing, people looking for the next big thing. Well, we have the next big thing here. So you're all going to have five minutes on the clock. Ready to roll? I'll take the silence and thumbs up as a yes. So th things are things are a little bit randomized. I want to kick things off with a, a company. I can't remember who, I think I got the intro from Techstars on this one, but Felipe with BioEsol, do you want to tell us what you guys are doing in Latin America and Mexico to transform energy? Yeah, for sure. Thank, thank you, Matt. Um, well, uh, let me share my, my screen. Let me get you here and give you the table. The floor is yours. Okay, you are, you are seeing, let me. It's starting the screen share now. We'll give it one second. And you let me know when you're ready to roll. We'll start the clock. You are, you are seeing my screen? It just says you've started screen sharing. For some reason, it's not sharing. Okay, At least I'm not so seeing it. I don't know if anyone else is. Let me. Try that one more time. If that doesn't work, we can hand it over to someone else while we figure out the technical difficulties. Here, you, fi you figure it out on your side, Felipe, and you can also email it over to me and I can click through for you. But okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna transfer things over then. We'll do a little bit of a pivot, so to speak. This is a, a startup show for a reason. How about Sam? You wanna take us away with carbon yield and what you guys are doing for regenerative agriculture? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Um, let me just get this in presentation mode and we'll be off and running. Is that you all up there? Good. You are good to go. You are on the clock. Take it away, Sam. Perfect. <clears throat> Carbon Yield recognizes that we need to start thinking <clears throat> about conventional farms as the coal plants of the 21st century, expensive, dirty, and dying. And we are building a platform to ensure that the alternative, that regenerative agriculture, becomes the norm, enabling our farmers to prosper while unlocking an essential climate solution. Um, I am Sam Schiller. Uh, we are building a platform uh, for the new regenerative farm economy to help the next generation of farmers transform our working lands. It has simply become too expensive to farm conventionally. In the U.S. over the last decade, more than half of farmers lost money for 10 consecutive years. A lot of this has to do with how expensive it is to farm degraded soil. Industrial farming strips from the soil, the roots, the life that help us consistently produce healthy food. And as soil degrades, U.S. farmers are adding more and more expensive fertilizer, and pesticides to eke out the same yields. This vicious cycle is terrible for the climate as more than 30% of the emissions swirling above us originated in our working lands. And we need to get back to our roots and build a better food system that works for everyone. Regenerative agriculture <clears throat> is the solution. We need to literally regenerate our soil. Cover cropping, avoiding tillage, integrating livestock, help bring back roots, fertility, life, carbon to the soil. And these practices wean farms from expensive fertilizer and chemicals, uh, making farming more profitable, more resilient to extreme weather, uh, and allow us to nourish our communities with healthy food. But the challenge really lies in transition. There are upfront costs for equipment and seeds, a learning curve for new crop rotations, and transitional resources from carbon markets are pretty inaccessible to most farmers. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty the moment a grower steps outside of a system they know with an established supply chain and a column of support behind them. But carbon yield establishes the alternative pillar of support behind our growers so they can confidently transition to regenerative agriculture at scale. We operate the hub where farmers make regenerative decisions, sell their grain, source their inputs, and produce new revenue streams from carbon markets. We help farmers get comfortable with making changes to their operation and ensure they realize the upsides and operational savings of a regenerative rotation. I'll give an example. Uh, Luke is a sixth generation farmer taken over for his dad on their farm in Indiana. 
he's ready to do things a little differently to improve the health of his soil so that it can be productive for his kids and their kids. We helped him model the benefits of adding rye to a no-till system and showed there was money to be made through generating carbon offsets. We also connected him to local farm experts to tailor his management system to conditions on the ground and are even exploring marketing his grain, uh, his rye at a premium. Our model will earn Luke another $30 per acre in new revenue, which comes to more than $200,000 over 10 years on top of significant operational savings. In order to scale up these services to meet the demand from our farm partners, we are building a digital portal where farmers share a bit about their farm, we provide tailored referrals, high, high to the how-to assistance, and market access to support profitable land stewardship. Um, farmers typically have found us to help first um, get access to carbon markets, maximize their value from these programs, and we have over 15 years of experience in these markets, which has helped us efficiently register projects, sell credits at a significant market premium, uh, emphasizing the unique climate benefits a regenerative farm creates. And our revenue model allows us to take a percentage of carbon sales and transactions brokered on our platform um, and to integrate a freemium arrangement for farm subscribers and corporate partners. We've had early success partnering with growers across the country. Um, we've secured over 270K in revenue um, partnering with farmers. Most of this work has focused again on uh, integrating growers uh, into, into carbon markets uh, and registering you know, premium offset credits. Um, our current pipeline includes over 125 farms. One minute warning, thousand. just FYI. What's that? One minute warning. Just what? Um, and uh, we've also developed relationships with food and ag uh, companies that are representing about 12K in monthly uh, recurring revenue. And there's a ton of tailwinds uh, from the buyer sides of the market. Most prominent food and apparel brands have science-based targets. They're struggling to meet them. And we're helping them get the right accounting, the technical assistance uh, to bring growers through the process of transition. Um, we've already worked with Nestle, Starbucks, uh, suppliers to Annie's uh, to, to help with these transitions. Uh, we're raising about a half million dollar round to help us continue to build out our tech platform and give us some runway to get to market. Um, and our team has significant experience. I've registered over 2 million tons of carbon offset credits and exited from a, a green startup. Um, and we've consulted some of the top agricultural brands uh, in, in, in the country, in the world. Um, and we envision a farm economy where farmers uh, succeed precisely because of how well they sustain our working lands. Excited to, to build that transition with all of you guys. Great job on the timing. You even beat the shot clock. Phenomenal. I'm going to bring the other investors back in, and then I will hand things over first to Aurel for questions for Sam. Great, thanks. So several questions. Uh, first of all, can you expand on the monitoring verification aspect of it? Like who are you working with? Um, and what does that look like in terms of voluntary market, non-voluntary market? And yeah. Yeah, we're, we're mostly in voluntary markets right now. We, we work primarily with Nori, uh, which is a carbon removal registry, um, as well as um, the ESMC, uh, which is a, a sort of a, a uh, corporate scope three reporting system. Um, but really, we believe that some of the value in these credits is in the monitoring. Um, and so while we may be required just to provide management data and run a climate model, we also voluntarily do um, a lot of soil sampling. Um, we're working with a group called the Soil Inventory Project that is kind of a lean sampling approach that makes sampling cheaper for growers, but still really accurate in capturing um, some of the extra benefits that you get um, from a truly regenerative rotation that might be missed by a practice-based model. Um, so we do a combination of collecting management data, running it through climate models, um, using uh, these soil sampling tools. Uh, and we're also exploring some remote sensing partnerships that would allow us um, to, to verify with satellite imagery and other kind of signatures to be able to, uh, to monitor those, uh, those, those changes on the landscape. Um, so we, we think this is a huge part of um, what makes it valuable to, to buyers of credits that, that really care about the permanence of these changes, um, the actual uh, emissions reductions. Um, so we do a good job of packaging that up within our platform, um, not putting the burden on the growers, but to really leverage the kind of full tech stack that we can bring uh, to, to monitor these changes. Um, and all projects are third party verified. Um, and so we, we work with a verifier here in, in uh, the United States uh, to, to monitor those projects. Okay, and one more question. Um, what does, let's say, let's take Luke, <laughs> what does the onboarding process look like for him? How long would it take? What does it require on his end? And yeah. yeah. Our, our goal is really to get that as, as short as possible. Um, we sort of think of the platform right now as like a turbo tax of these markets, um, getting the, the few pieces of input that you need to be able to understand is someone eligible for a program? 
um, you know, basically what their operation is and, and using some of the tools that we have at our disposal um, to be able to fill in some of the gaps. Um, we usually start in, in general with a 30 minute kind of intake with growers. Um, we, we haven't been able to get that out of the process yet because there's a lot of explanation that needs to happen to, to figure out that, you know, these markets are a fit, um, un understand the kind of value proposition of these markets. Um, so we still have some face-to-face -face time with growers, um, but are trying to use technology to ease that kind of path in to collect management data. Um, we, we usually take one or two representative fields as opposed to modeling an entire farm just to get information in a grower's hands quickly. Um, so we think that that, um, you know, the, the time from when a grower reaches out to us and gets into the top of our funnel to when they get information about their value capture, um, we have to get information to them, you know, within four weeks, six weeks, um, hopefully quicker than that, um, to, to be able to, to continue to grease the wheels towards market participation. Um, we, we anticipate in the future that being fully automated, um, but at, at this stage, that's, that's what our onboarding looks like. Great, thanks. And Ryan, did you have any questions for Sam? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks, Sam. This was this was great, and, and uh, in full transparency, we're big believers in what Carbon Yield uh, and Sam and Claire and the team are doing there. We're investors in in their company, and so this is great to see um, the evolution of this overall. Sam, I think an important question um, for other investors, and I'm sure others on the call as well, is how you think about the nuances around regenerative farming. Obviously, it's not as black and white as organic farming. So, how are you as you scale and offer this to more farmers, and obviously there's this regenerative movement that's happening across the country and really the world, um, how are you thinking about uh, adding in some of those layers of the sort of regenerative landscape overall? Yeah, well, I think one of the advantages of collecting all of this management data from our growers is, is we have a really great data set to use to start benchmarking. Um, we've also gotten some data from USDA and other sources to be able to see like what is kind of the, the state of the art now and how are growers comparing to that. Um, we don't want to set up high barriers so that no one can participate in the regenerative movement, but we also don't want to set the, the, uh, the, the level too low and, and actually just greenwash and sort of um, exclude some of the, you know, a, a allow for activities that are not creating actual benefit. Um, so I, my definition of regenerative agriculture is really to incorp incorporate multiple practices. These are not marginal, like, you know, you just do no-till, you just do cover crop. This is, there's synergy from adding more and more of these practices together. Um, and so we want to help growers integrate that next practice. Um, and there really is a glide path as you start on that journey to regenerative agriculture. Um, but I think in, in the future, when we start communicating to corporates on the other side of our market, um, we, we see incorporating a grading system um, so that you can see that there really is a gradient um, and helping to show, you know, this is an A plus farmer, this is a B farmer that's making improvement, um, sort of leaning into that gradient aspect instead of having a certification approach because it's not a one size fit all um, approach. And there are really great farms that have to use a little bit of herbicide or have to use a little bit of fertilizer um, still while, while incorporating these other practices. And so we don't wanna exclude them just because they're using some synthetics, um, but it's a directional change and it's really a, a combination effort of these various practices to, to get towards regenerative. Um, that, that's what we believe will, will resonate. Great. Uh, well, one more question, if, if we have time, um, is just thinking about the scalability of this. How, how much of this, as you, as you grow, do you think there'll still be um, touch points with the farmers versus sort of uh, onboarding um, technology that allows farmers to come on and sort of do this uh, in their own manual way? Or how are you thinking about that evolution over time? Yeah, I, I think that the um, there's a huge tech race right now in both direct measurement and in remote sensing. Um, you know, billions of dollars are going, flowing into these kinds of um, uh, companies. And, and I think that we are in a position to really leverage those technologies. A lot of those firms, um, you know, have, have really great products, but have not figured out how they plug into carbon markets, how they communicate across these other value streams. So we, we want to be the kind of value creating hub um, that unlocks some of those technologies. But I, I really do think that it's going to become a fully automated pro process. We just don't want to wait for that to happen. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a lot that, that needs to happen in the next couple of years here um, to make sure that these markets have credibility, um, that they have some throughput. And um, we're, we're here to sort of work with what's available, but um, to be prepared for w when everything is fully automated and, and you know, we, we can do this in five minutes, a couple clicks. Um, that, that's, that's the vision is, is to become that kind of hub, that, that automated frictionless hub for the regenerative economy. Great, thanks. And what, 
entirely is your business model. How much money are you making per farm that you're onboarding? That's something that I didn't really, really see in the presentation. Yeah, I mean, part of it depends. And, and frankly, in the past, we've had more of a consult, consultative model where we've worked with um, asset owners that say, hey, um, we'll do a feasibility study, we'll pay you as consultants, we'll give you five, ten thousand dollars to look across our portfolio and figure out where there's value and sort of set up our reporting systems. We're moving away from that model to um, you know, taking a percentage of transactions that are brokered. So we take 15 to 30 percent of our carbon uh, transactions, um, you know, with an incentive to get the price up. Um, and we have some some nice relationships there um, where we secured like hundred dollar per ton uh, off take agreements for some of our pilot farmers. Um, so we, we take a percentage of those sales of grain sales, input sales. Um, uh, and then we also eventually see ourselves having a kind of um, a subscription model where we charge per acre for, for folks enrolling in our system. So that'd be something like $2 per acre um, to enroll. So um, we, we want to delay that because we, we want to make sure that we're providing services to our growers. We're not taxing the very growers that are experimenting with our platform. Um, but the, the value capture for us per acre is somewhere around you know, $10, $15 an acre um, as we continue to onboard. One potential challenge I see is how do you keep people engaged in using the system? Once you've taught someone how to exercise, how to eat healthy, they don't need you to keep teaching them. And once you've taught them how to do carbon market and carbon offsets, they don't, they don't need you. So the kind of the two big value adds seem like one-time yeah. things. Well, so these carbon projects are 10-year projects, and there is a record-keeping requirement and monitoring re requirement, and um, we, we are providing that kind of accounting backbone for those projects, and that gives us one pretty important tether between us and, and the growers. Um, but, you know, we want to have a community platform as well as part of this. We talked a little bit about sort of providing community and confidence to our growers. Um, but a lot of growers, as they're implementing these practices, they have questions or they have a pest problem and they need someone that's gone through that same experience uh, to, to help them find a solution. And so we want that conversation to be happening on our platform in that kind of everyday kind of, kind of way. And there, there are a lot of great um, you know, podcasts out there. We've heard sort of an informal exchange of these ideas, but the idea of kind of organizing that conversation, making it um, location um, connected. So, you know, if there's someone in Missouri and you're a Missouri farmer um, that's experienced this or someone that has a similar rotation, kind of organizing that set of information and allowing that conversation to happen on our platform. Um, so we think that will create benefits for our subscribers. Um, and every year you got to um, grow and sell crops. And, um, and we think that we can, you know, with more diversity, it becomes more complex to find a market for alfalfa, find a market for rye. And we think that uh, every year as that complexity takes place in the farms, we're going to be there to help um, find markets, find value for, for those important regenerative crops. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for doing. It was a great presentation. I, can I uh, I'm add super something excited. quickly before we move on? Yeah, of course. Or um, go for it. I just wanted to say that I think it's it's like very amazing that you're making farming more relatable to our generation in a way. I mean, there's like this huge trend that, you know, farmers are, uh, there's clearly a lack of farmers and our generation is turning away from that. So I think it's, um, there's a huge need to make this profession more relatable to our generation. And it looks like you guys are doing that. So good job. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. They are doing that. And I want to hand things over to the next company of the night who's trying to do a not quite regenerative agriculture, but they're trying to certainly make agriculture a little bit more uh, sustainable. I want to hand things over to Dennis with Symbergy. Dennis, you want to take things away? Yes. Uh, let me just share my screen as well. And then just let me know when you're ready to go and we will start your timer. Yeah, let me know if you can see. Looking good, loud Just and clear. Look Take good. it away. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Matt. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Dennis, and I'll be talking about Symbachi. We are located in Switzerland, and these are the key problems that we are trying to approach. First off, crop failures. We've seen many of them last year. Um, it's even getting worse this year, the way it looks. Um, maybe you've heard about the droughts in Italy. So it's a constant problem for growing food, or at least it is for conventional agriculture. Uh, the next problem we're looking at is fertilizer scarcity, or now even the massive price hikes that are happening partially because of the Ukraine conflict. 
And last but not least, consumers want their food to be grown more sustainably. Um, that's just how they want this to happen nowadays. Uh, so what exactly do we do? So we are located at the northern portal of the longest train tunnel in the world. Uh, the town is called Erstfeld. It's really in the heart of Switzerland. And if you dig a hole this long, um, it will create a lot of water coming out of it. Uh, it just collects that throughout the mountains. And someone had the brilliant idea of um, taking that water and breeding fish with it. And because it is the longest train tunnel, there's a lot of water coming out of it. And the fish farm will be the largest fish farm in Switzerland. Now, we want to use their effluents or their wastewater. We are going to treat this wastewater in a way that the nutrients become available for plant production. We then use hydroponic system to grow plants uh, in this little town. Uh, because this is a massive operation, we have the option to scale this up pretty highly. Um, our goal is to have an acreage of 12,000 square meters just in Eerstfeld there. And the main reason for this is so we can obviously produce plants, but also we can create data models about how these waste effluents are turned into nutrients and the nutrient uptake of the plants. Because if this is done correctly, at the end, we will have clean water again that can either be returned to the, um, its original source or back to the fish farm if needed. Now, by doing this, we are actually solving a problem of the fish farm itself uh, because they need to have that wastewater cleaned quite expensively. So we are adding value to them as well as producing um, sustainably grown crops at the same time. Now, with these data models and the ability to sort of clean water, um, we can take this to similar fish farms uh, because the oceans are pretty much um, overfished and land-based fish farms are basically the latest trends and a lot of them will have this specific problem. Now, how are we going about this? Um, first off, we need to build a scalable base system as a, a hydroponic system with a wastewater treatment um, in front of it, which is going to cost about 1.2 million Swiss francs. And this is what we're currently raising. Once we have this single part, we can multiply them locally and start creating data models that we then can use at other places to achieve the same goals, clean water, um, healthy crops and solving problems for fish farms. And compared to other hydroponic projects, this also means we can create revenue from cleaning water, not only from growing plants. Now, very quickly, um, again, we are in the innovation project phase, uh, the first column there. We are raising um, 1 million in equity. We've already raised 400,000 well, 400, Swiss francs. Those are already secured. So 600 are still open. Um, we are a supplier of the largest distributor in Switzerland. They're called Migro. Um, we have a relationship with Reich Swan, which is one of the biggest um, seed suppliers worldwide. We also work with Sisek and Afry, both are, both are engineering companies. Afry is currently the leading engineering office that works on these land-based fish farms. So this is how we have access to potential expansion later on. Now, this is where we stand. Later on, we're obviously going to need a lot more money. This is capital intensive because they're basically industrial projects. But most importantly, in the end, if our financial projections uh, towards the right, you can look at those. It is quite viable and profitable, despite it being in the primary section of an economy with agriculture. Um, but we will also expand the product base towards pharmaceuticals. Um, sorry, I forgot main... to give you a one minute time timer. Uh, time oh, is up. Sorry, Dennis. Let me, let, oh, me that's bring, actually good. let me bring back Aurel and um, Ryan. And do you want to just share quickly how much you're raising? Uh, one million in equity. One Six hundred are still not secure. Yes. Oh, yeah. You, you said that. My my apologies. Yeah. My apologies. This oh, time, this. this time we'll let uh, we we did ladies first. Ryan, you're up this time. Do you have questions for Dennis? 
Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Appreciate the presentation and thanks so much for walking us through it. Um, can you, one thing that I'm trying to grasp is is how this, you know, whether this is a localized solution or something that scales across different geographies and what that looks like. Um, can you just walk us through when you develop the, the initial sort of working uh, model of this, how easy that is to replicate and what that market looks like overall um, across the you know, whether you're region or, or globally? Yeah, so we scale up locally first to these 8,000 plants per day that we could produce um, because this is a reliable number to create data models that can be replicated um, towards other projects around the world. Now, the land-based fish farms um, that are similar to the one we are working with is a newer trend. Um, so we know there's over 30 projects in Europe alone that are similar to this, um, but that's about it for the time being. Um, we have, as we mentioned, we are working with Afry, who is the leading engineering company. They have a pretty good grasp on uh, where all these projects are. And uh, they're pretty much involved in all of them because no one has as much knowledge as, as they do in this specific area. So for us, it would be quite simple to move on to, well, we are calculating with five additional sites, uh, the numbers at the end from the last slide, by the way. Got it. And then my last question, well, uh, my next question, I should say, is um, just in how you think about the impact that you can have from a climate perspective. Um, have you modeled that out or do you have a, a good understanding of what this would look like even now or at scale in terms of the, the impact that it can have? Yeah, so the CO2 equivalent per kilogram of herbs that we would produce uh, would reduce emissions, but it's 42 kilos. So if we produce a kilogram of herbs, we say 42 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. And what is your anticipated scale as you grow in terms of, of how you do that? So if we operate five sites, we're looking at 40,000 plants per day that are being produced. And uh, roughly three herbal plants are a, give or take a kilo. So 12,000 times 42,000, so 400,000 kilograms of CO2 then? Yes. I mean, one side should be able to, um, in the calculations that we've made, it was roughly 2,000 tons per year that we could save per site with a basis of 8,000 plants. So with five sites, that's uh, 10,000 tons per year. What about on the fertilizer replacement side of things? Because I know we talked about that before. That that's still where I see the the more scalable businesses. So if the fertilizer part, um, the fertilizers themselves aren't really the problem. Um, what we're saving is uh, basically the production of fertilizers, and that is um, in these calculations less than a kilogram saved. Um, in CO2 equivalents um, per kilogram of herbs. So it's comparatively low what we're helping out with if we're just looking at fertilizers um, themselves. Really, because creating fertilizer is 20% of agricultural emissions, just the creation of the fertilizers themselves. Sorry, I was digging into this with another <laughs> company I'm working with as an advisor, DOTS. So in our case, we'd be um, comparing with um, just conventional agriculture in most, well, European nations. And a fair bit of them are on relatively good levels um, <laughs> on their production. So they are not really that bad for the environment. Uh, most farmers are quite modern and the use of mechanization is reasonable, let's put it that way. Um, obviously, most countries have an interest that less and less herbicides, pesticides and fertilizers are used because it can um, 
uh, it can end up in the groundwater. Uh, so it turns out um, we're not doing that much better overall than um, these farmers that we compare ourselves to. The main component we are helping with is transportation and that we produce products that have to be imported from warmer regions, for example. Okay, thanks for clarifying. And Ryan, sorry for cutting you off. Did you have other questions? No. Aurora, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, I have one question. So I can imagine that in Switzerland, um, this specific fish farm that you're speaking about is probably the, the best fish farm in the world in terms of the conditions that the fish are living in and how well managed it is. And I'm sure you understand what I mean in terms of uh, Swiss logistics. Um, <laughs> so I guess my question is like, I'm wondering how replicable this model is literally anywhere else in the world where these fish farms aren't necessarily in the best condition. So I guess just like sanitation wise, quality and safety, like how do you see that in terms of expanding globally? So most projects in this particular field are happening in Europe and the leading country uh, by far is Norway. They have roughly 27 projects ongoing. Uh, they're really strong in this field. And um, well, the rest is sort of placed in different places in Europe, but most of them are um, quite modernized industrial nations. So the first projects where we can expand to, um, I don't believe it's a problem that the, let's say the quality wouldn't suit our needs. Okay, thank you. And your plan is to operate the fish farms yourselves versus potentially oh, no, no, well, like that? No, 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 well, we don't really operate the fish farms at all. Um, we have, well, we build relationship. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I meant agro yeah. agroponic farms themselves on top. So the first one, for sure, um, because we need to have absolute um, access to the data itself, and our sensors will be um, obviously near the plants, so we can uh, check nutrient update. But once we have the base models, it can absolutely make sense that we have other people who run the hydroponic side of things. This, again, this is not the focus of it. Our focus is to figure out how to most optimally turn wastewater into nutrients and make sure that at the end we end up with clean water. So it definitely is an option to later on have both the financing side as well as the operation side of the the hydroponic process given to someone else who may be better at this. Understood. I, I see that much more as the VC case, giving that away and handling the the core, the core effluents and water processing. It just seems more scalable. Yes. But maybe maybe and that's just me personally. We just have to make sure every time that we have access to the data and that we are exclusively the ones who will be sitting on that data. Mm -hmm. Understood. Understood. Well, Dennis, thanks. Thanks for sharing. I want to hand things over then to our next startup of the night, Felipe. I'm going to uh, switch the spotlight over to you. And while we are, I want to take a quick time out to tell you that today's startup tank session, our climate investor Shark Tank bit show, so to speak, not trademarked or of any kind. So don't worry about that, is brought to you guys by Forward VC, our early stage climate syndicate. We invest in pre-seed and seed stage climate companies around the world, focused primarily on Europe, North America, and Israel, although we might have to take a look at um, LATAM and Mexico because of uh, BioESOL here. They're doing some really interesting things. To learn more about us and what we do, please visit forward.vc, the number forward.vc, to learn more about our Uncredited Investor Syndicate and to apply. And now I'm going to hand things over to Felipe. Let's see, Felipe. I will share my screen so you can get your pitch deck. And let me know if you are seeing this. I believe I, I, I don't know if you are already seeing. What? Sorry? You are already seeing my, my screen or not? Yeah. yeah. That, okay, perfect. Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you, Matt, again, and thanks for having us. So, well, my, my name is Felipe, co-founder and CEO of PSO. So it's hard to believe, but just a few days ago, a baby surgery went badly wrong. 
when the power was cut in the middle of all operations. So energy problems happen every day uh, with more or less serious consequences. And not only do they include power outages, but also high energy costs, but quality and at the end, negative climate, climate impacts. And it doesn't have to be this way. One so sec, Felipe, guess, do you think your screen, do you think, are you screen sharing? Because right now my screen is sharing and no one sees your screen. Yeah, I see I'm, the solution slide. Yeah, it, it is. Oh, I, okay. I, I have screen yeah. sharing on. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Forget, ignore me. <laughs> no, no problem. So at BSO, we take care of these issues by building an energy steel intelligent software and a revolutionary battery a solution that increase renewable energy use and provide continuous power for critical applications. All developing within a time frame and cost that outcompetes the rest of the market. Our software is powered by AI and weather forecasting. As a result, companies take complete control of the stored energy and ensure 24-7 continuous operations. So what may, makes BSO better than any other battery company? Let me share three patterns that showcase our innovative approach. First, we double the lifespan of our battery twice as long as any other brand. Second, our battery functions without any interruption, not even microseconds. Not all their company has been able to do this. And last, we supply energy as direct current at 148 volts, three times higher than the, our closest competitors. In addition to this, our unique business model allows us to cover the gaps that other players don't need. So far, we have seen positive results with more than 30 businesses. For example, a company made is building fully energy independent by plugging our battery into its solar panels. They now, they now have all the power they need to, to operate at, at uh, saving 100% on energy costs and producing CO2 emissions. Market-wise, we're focused on the sector that are most affected by the cost and the quality of the energy. Did you know that more than 20% of renewable energy is wasted due to a lack of energy storage? The arena estimates that the world needs 150 gigawatts of battery storage, and today we only have 11% installed. Our market has a global value of $200 billion, we are proven B2B continuous energy solution, offering a solution through an innovative subscription service. We are already signed up 32 customers with an annual room rate on $800,000. Our sales projections show exponential growth planning to grow 30x in 22 and have reached the 200 million goal by the late 24. Bioso team has deep experience in the entrepreneurship and the energy sector. It co founded the leading light lighting company in Mexico and has had for exit. Our philosophy and metrics are totally aligned with three United Nations SDGs. So we are currently raising $1.5 million. This capital will go to optimize our manufacturing process, sales and marketing, and key hires to kick off our expansion strategy to the rest of Latin. So now is the time to scale. There is a huge and unsatisfied market actively looking for this solution. Uh, partner with us and let's impact together. Let's impact together. Awesome pitch, Felipe. Thanks for sharing BOE Sold. Let me bring Ryan and Orel back in and hand the mic over to Orel for questions. Do you have any questions for Felipe and what they're doing? Around. So um, I'd like to ask, where is the IP, where has it been developed, who uh, invented this technology, and if you have any patents, um, and where the patents lie, if you have any? Yeah, for sure. So uh, our R&D team has been working for the last 35 years. Uh, they are already uh, passing uh, 50 uh, innovative innovations uh, through these years. And uh, well, we have uh, until now we have three patents that we filed in Mexico, and we're in process to file it as well in, in the WIPO. So uh, we are working at this moment to develop uh, three more patents during the next six months. Okay, and why why specifically only Latin America? Um, is it because like Tesla got everywhere else first, or <laughs> like? 
that's really part of your identity and your um, vision. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, there is a, a, a huge opportunity right here because we are the only company that is located in, in, in Latin that is involved in the design, in the develop, and obviously in, in the manufacturing side. Uh, in this case, uh, we are uh, focused on, on, on the market that Tesla or other uh, uh, companies are not, not, not seeing or not focusing. And uh, obviously, we, we are not only bringing the, the technology to the market, we are also are, are bringing the financial tools in order to, 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 to allow the customers to, to, to buy this kind of solution. So uh, Latin, Latin America has two problems. Uh, obviously, we are uh, contributing with the climate impact. And the other hand, we have the, uh, the energy poverty. We have until now 20, 20 million persons that are living in, in energy poverty. So we are in the, in the medium to long term to, to impact in this area also. Okay. Um, and I guess my last question is, I don't want to get too technical because Matt knows that we can discuss batteries here for hours, but um, what is your technology most comparable to? Is it lithium ion based? Is it closer to a supercapacitor? Um, yeah, it's, it's the lithium ion, yeah. um, but also we are working in, in different materials uh, like lithium phosphate, and we in the uh, next six months we are going to work with the zinc. Uh, so at this moment we are using lithium ion for the last uh, three years. But ultimately, we are, we are going to be uh, trying to, to figure out what's the best material in order to, to have this, this uh, solution uh, ready to the market. Thank you. Hey, Felipe, uh, great presentation and good to connect with you again. Awesome to see the traction and evolution um, that you've had over the last couple of months. Can you just uh, walk us through a little bit in terms of how you're acquiring customers right now? Where does that come from? Um, what's your go-to-market strategy overall? Um, and then sort of a complimentary question after that is like, just for, for, for me to understand a little bit more of how the product works, can you walk us through how a typical customer is actually using the solution? How many, um, you know, are they, are you seeing it in terms of the hardware and the software? What does that look like overall in terms of, of the customers that are currently using it? Yeah, for sure, right. Um, and also nice to connect again. So, uh, first of all, our go-to-market strategy. Uh, at the beginning, we, we uh, like in, in, we are with one of our, uh, let's say, sister company that they, they the lead lighting company that uh, I mentioned during the pitch. Uh, they already have 600 uh, customers, so we, we uh, leverage in, in that customer base uh, that, that was at the beginning. And then uh, we developed two, two channels. The first one, our, our direct channel, uh, where we, uh, until now, we are uh, obtaining uh, 18 weeks uh, on an average week, uh, uh, quality leads, I must say. And the other one is that we develop a, a, a distributor network that are a solar panels a company. Until now, we have 20 customer, 20 companies that are in our distributor network, and they already have a, a customer base. And we are complementing its portfolio. So for us, we are trying to, to leverage our solution and to scale our solution through other commercial structures that are already in place. Uh, not only in Mexico, but also in, in, in Colombia, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina. We already have initial conversation in Colombia uh, with the, the two main uh, companies in the solar panel industry, um, as well in Chile. Uh, so that, that is uh, around our go-to-market strategy. Um, uh, regarding the, the customers, well, the, there is two kinds of customers that we are reaching. We are focused on the small and medium companies. And uh, most of them, they, they don't have, uh, two, one of them doesn't have uh, solar panels. They have a lot of problems related with the quality or the, the cost of the energy. So in, in this case, uh, most of our customers ask for an integral solution. That means that they need or they ask for a solar panel with, with along with our battery and the software. So that, that is the one kind. And the, the second one is the, the, the businesses that already have solar panels, 
but they are uh, they are uh, injected that energy through their green but they don't escape of the problems that, that happen in, in Mexico and in Latin, that there is the, the, the poor quality of uh, many interruptions. So in this case, we, we, with our battery, we install it, and all the energy that is generated by the solar panel is, is storage, and we use it in, inside the, the building. So in that case, we, we eliminate uh, at the most possible uh, any dependence of a third party, in this case, uh, of the energy supply that, uh, it, that is the major energy supply in Mexico and in most of the uh, countries in Latin America that are the government. Got it. Well, uh, one other question, and this sort of ties into what Aurel was asking as well, but how do you view your company in terms of the differentiation that you bring? Obviously, there are some pretty big, heavy players in this space, and it's fairly competitive. Do you see your differentiation on the tech side at all? Or is it uh, in more of the your your the market that you're going after in terms of the geographic location, or how do you see sort of the again the, the differentiation that you have in comparative to to a lot of the other players that are out there? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so our competitive advantage or our differentiation are uh, licensing three by pilots: the technology, the market approach, and the re revenue model. The technology, well, I, I already covered. We differentiate in. in, in with uh, our three patents, uh, uh, the, the, the second one is the market approach. Uh, we, we are uh, focused on the uh, small and medium companies, the players that Tesla beside the US, they are only focused, uh, at least in, in Latin America, I only focus on big energy storage uh, solution, uh, like from one megawatt to a boat. And the other players are focused on, on unique or small solutions, uh, mostly for off-grid operations. So we are focused on, on uh, the small, medium companies like uh, hotels, hospitals, uh, telecommunication companies, and uh, industries. And the third is the, the revenue model. Uh, we, we have a three revenue model. One of these is one-time sell uh, of our hardware. The, the, the second one is related with our software that we offer to a software as a service model with a recurring income. And the third one is the, the, the new one uh, in the couple of the, the last couple of months we developed an energy as a service model that allows us to offer a compressive solution to companies through which we complementally respond to their energy needs, offering from generation, storage, and the management of the energy, uh, always seeking to leverage renewable energy. So in similar companies that offer like power purchase agreement, uh, focus on large projects and didn't include or don't include energy stores. So these three pillars are our main differentiation and no other company is, is offering this to the market and doesn't have this, this kind of approach. Uh, can I just jump in on a follow-up question on that? Can you just expand a bit what the SaaS model includes? Because that's quite unique. Okay, uh, regarding the energy as a service model? No, the SaaS model, the second one that you mentioned. Okay, yeah. Uh, in this case, we, we offer our uh, software uh, that is, at this moment, we are monitor all the energy related uh, from the generation, the storage, and the use. So at this moment, uh, we are uh, giving to the user a more transparent way to, to, to see how the uh, energy is consumed and, and is used. So we, we uh, develop we develop this software and we are giving to the user this uh, through a app, uh, so they can monitor all 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 the aspect of the energy. And we are working to to at this moment to upgrade our second version with AI and uh, big data, machine learning, weather forecasting, in order to give a powerful tool to, uh, to the user so they can take informed decision. Uh, for example, if uh, tomorrow is going to be clouded, so the energy production is going to be limited. Uh, so the, 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 in this guy, case, uh, the software is going to suggest to the user to limit some uh, uh, air condition at, what, uh, at any given time of the day or shut down some specific uh, areas in order to uh, 
to have the energy that they need uh, the next the following day to operate without any kind of interruption so we are uh, trying to to move from the actual uh, way to do it, things to have uh, emergency plans or ups or no breaks uh, kind of stuff to the, the other side of the, of the table where we can take uh, informed decision and take the control of our operation uh, using the energy in the most uh, efficient way can you potentially do a value-based pricing model versus right now you have your subscription model, but it's it's super cheap. It's like 15 bucks a month, you were telling me, which is nothing for a building. But if you're saving a building thousands or tens of thousands in energy a month. Yeah, for sure, Matt. Uh, it, actually, we, we, we develop a, a model uh, in our lending company uh, for the government because they don't have money to, to pay us. So we developed this uh, uh, like a savings uh, agreement in order to to charge uh, through the the chain that they they uh, achieved during the time. So yes, we, we can develop that as well. And what do your margins look like on the different lines? Well, it, 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 regarding the hardware, we are in the thirty eight percent at this moment uh, gross margin. Uh, we, we didn't achieve until now uh, economies of scale we, we are in the next three to four months we, we are going to hit the 45 to 48 percent gross margin uh, and uh, regarding the the software we are in the 85 uh, percent then what about for the energy when you're doing the energy financing that's the, that's the big business unlock from what i understand is once you start doing energy as a service mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, at this moment we have a huge uh, sales pipeline that comes from 252 uh, customers that uh, summarize 32 million dollars. So uh, once that we, we we have this this amount of uh, potential customers in our sales pipeline, we find out that they they are asking for a, a financial solution. Uh, and in the market, there is not a single bank or financial institution that offers a tailored uh, uh, financial uh, uh, product. Uh, most of them are in the in, in a two or three years or four years period. So that doesn't make sense for the customer. So we, we are trying to develop this energy as a service model where uh, we are not going to ask any money, don't, no doubt, don't pay me from, from the user side. Uh, we are going to set a 10 year contract and we are going to uh, uh, we are going to ask for the for the customers a, a monthly subscription service a monthly fee during this time uh, and we are going to install all the the, the hardware and ca can include the, the solar panels our battery and the software so for us it, it means that we are going to 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 to, to have a complete solution that is not only going to solve the, the energy related problem, also the financial problem to acquire this. And there is not a single company that are focused on this market and, and offering a complete solution. Understood, understood. I think that's everything from my side. Um, Ryan, Oral, any last questions for Felipe? Thanks. Yeah, no, this was great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank then you. Thank Thanks for sharing, Felipe. It looks like we have made it to the, the halftime point. Uh, now is a great time while I set up our next presenter. Um, Tino, how about how about you tell us a little bit more about Baru? And while you're getting ready, um, I just want to say thanks again to Leva for helping us make all of this happen. Leva is the best way to set up an SPV. It's a nice, digital, easy way to get rid of the lawyers, get rid of the paperwork, simplify the accounting and everything so that in five minutes, you've got an SPV up and running. Uh, to learn more and find out, set up your first SPV. I think it's your first, it might be your second SPV free. Just tell them that the Startup Tank sent you at forward, the number four, ward.vc slash Leva. But now I want to hand things over to a, a real interesting company I just met recently, Tino in Baru. They've uh, they've reimagined manufacturing, so to speak, and uh, automatized it and brought it to, uh, yeah, Zuckerberg might be excited about this one and the augmented reality potentials. You ready to take it away, Tino? 
I am. Um, thank you. Thanks for the great intro. So um, I founded this company called Baru. We are reinventing manufacturing supply chains. At the same time, we're helping small local businesses and saving the environment. So the way this, the way we're approaching it is we're taking existing but idle CNC robotics and tying them together into a virtual factory to reshore manufacturing back into our communities. That makes Baru super capital efficient. And we're addressing the wood furniture and the cabinet space first because it's a $35 billion market that wastes $15 billion on shipping and handling. And all of that shipping em emits immense amounts of CO2 every single year, enough to uh, drive 2 million cars per year, actually. And then even though we're a software program and platform, we're creating demand for underused or for uh, displaced workers. And that by simply tapping into the idle time on the thousands of CNC machines that are already in, in, uh, in use all over the United States and all over the world. We've reinvented a brand new category called customer to manufacturer. So we have a patent on the use of augmented reality to control manufacturing. So if, if a customer is buying one of our pieces of furniture, they'll be able to use our app to be able to see it, change the colors and the uh, material, resize it to fit. And when they're happy with the way it looks, they simply click buy and we deliver it in two weeks. We've connected a buyer's imagination with the code that drives a machine in their hometown. And by reducing the supply chain to a hometown process, not only do we reduce timing, but we also reduce immense amounts of cost structure. The existing $35 billion market is all crammed on the left side of this chart where retailers are offering limited selections in limited configurations, sizes, materials, and colors. We've expanded buyer's choices to every, almost every size and configuration. So we're expanding the market actually. And from that total potentially $40 billion market, we're gonna capture a big chunk of it by offering custom quality furniture and cabinetry at mainstream prices. We started our pilot when Google put us on their employee perks site. Googlers all over the country were starting, were bought custom sized desks for their home offices during COVID. We expanded to 29 cities with that pilot, and now we're starting to scale sales. And also, um, we just got notice that the Department of Defense wants to see our patent to, to deploy it in their own operations. So we're scaling sales with cabinetry by establishing a dealer network. They can get ca custom cabinets and resell it at a 40% lower price than the, the typical custom maker. We have no shortages. We have, we're using superior materials and it's faster delivery because it's locally made. We can grow to a billion dollars in sales with zero manufacturing investment or inventory because it's all been deployed and all we're doing is buying the inventory, the materials on demand. By simply being in the top 60 metro areas, we'll be, serving 225 million people, two thirds of the US population. Our growth path is by introduce, by achieving some market uh, sustainability in one region and then the existing 29 regions and then uh, with deeper penetration and as well, we're expanding our geographies also. We've got all the talent that we need to scale uh, Baru into a multi-million dollar run rate. Heidi is a superb operations, um, professional. Uh, Leland was our first manufacturing partner, uh, an expert in automation in this field and the former Cabinet Makers Association president. Constantine's full, a full stack developer. My own background is in corporate finance. We've had $352,000 invested by angels. We're raising a seed round of a million dollars. 700,000 will go into revenue acceleration and margin generation. So as we as those margins accumulate and grow over the regions, we're reinvesting those margins into more sales acceleration and category expansion and product uh, growth.
Well, this is the perfect time to join Baru and pour jet fuel on the fire. We're revolutionizing manufacturing. We're creating hometown jobs. We're rebuilding local economies and saving the environment. And your time your is question. up. Awesome. Thank you, Tino. That was a, that was a great pitch. Uh, super excited about what you guys are doing, especially the the reshoring jobs is a is a big deal. Just the the capacity. I remember you were telling me two hours a day these machines are getting used. Uh, the rest of that's a, a total waste. I will I will hand things over to Ryan first since I've already had a, a crack at this one. Ryan, do you have questions for Tino and for for Tino and for Baru? Yeah, thanks so much. And Tino, um, again, great to see you and and uh, congrats on the success uh, the last uh, year or so. Um, it, it, just in terms of, of thinking about sort of the entire life cycle of your product, can you just walk us through the, so obviously understand the impact of having lo more localized manufacturing plants, but, and I'm sorry if you went over this, but can you just uh, um, talk through the sort of supply chain and obviously scope three emissions is an important aspect of this, but how are you sort of thinking about the sustainability of the actual material that goes into this instead of just kind of the localized aspect of the manufacturing plant. Uh, and again, sorry if you walked us through this, but we would love to understand that a little bit more. Yeah, we can, uh, okay, we're, uh, our bill of materials is essentially comprised of uh, the materials that exist in, in a market. And so with more, and since these, so, these materials are generally sold nationwide, they, they generally uh, comply with uh, the most strict uh, regulatory standards like California's CARB II emissions and all of that. And, um, and these materials already exist in the market, so we're not bringing it in. Um, we choose to not bring it in to avoid the expense. And um, yeah, so the, uh, in terms of uh, carbon output, we're actually carbon negative because we've reduced it down to a hometown ecosystem footprint and we wipe it out by planting offsets. Got it. And so because it's localized and you get the materials from each individual city or region that you're in, does that mean that the products will differ based on which region you're, you're in? Or is there, uh, how, do you, how do you control for quality there then? Yeah, continent to continent probably. But for example, uh, the, the materials are generally made in big uh, centralized manufacturing factories and they're distributed to local, de local warehouses. And so that's how we achieve uniformity and quality control on the materials. Okay, and, th okay. and, then, and then my last question is on, um, can you remind me how many manufacturing plants you have up and running right now? How many cities you have? Yeah, we are in 29 cities with, um, Generally, one plant per city, uh, and then how? And, but we'll Go be ahead. able to we'll, we'll be able to replicate. You know, there are about four thousand of these machines out in the wild and in use, and so eventually we'll have overlapping geographies to to introduce some competition on the supply side, and all, also to um, provide some redundancy just in case we get like a big building order for the four you know four story forty thousand square foot building. We can we can distribute within the region to be able to supply in, in a timely fashion. Got it. And how long does it take to get a new, uh, a new city up and running or new region? About a week because uh, most of that time is uh, convincing the, the business owner that we're real. Afterwards, uh, you know, we're using the same software they are. And so they just take our file and open it up and it's ready to manufacture. Okay, great. Burrell? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. The first one being, um, I mean, you're addressing so many issues with such a fantastic solution. Um, where do you see the bottlenecks in this process? Right now, we need, we need a certain amount of funding to get the word out because it's a, as, as, you, you've, as you've already addressed kind of in your question, it's, it's a story. We have to tell that story. We have to drive that awareness. And so, um, yeah, that's the bottleneck right now. It's, it's marketing. So it's tying in the whole story together, making it function wherever you choose to apply it. Yeah, because uh, the, the manufacturing, you know, we've, we've proven it amply. We've proven it amply. We've replicated in the 29 cities, with, even with low volumes. That just means that higher volumes will be easier 
to attract that supply side network. Yeah. Um, and then I guess cost wise, what does a typical table or cabinet look? I mean, not kitchen cabinet, because I understand that's definitely more expensive, but let's just say like upright standing table cost compared to a conventional one. Yeah, the well, every well, it's uh, for furniture, it's a little bit more, uh, more pricey than. Uh, at this point, because we haven't achieved the material scales and uh, material yield equation uh, of volume. But with the cabinetry, we're selling at about 30% higher price than Ikea mm -hmm. and competing with custom makers that are selling at 5X Ikea. And so that's, that's how we can get dealers because we can be selling at a, a pretty reasonable price. They can do a markup to achieve a price point to their customers at a, at a, a level similar or approaching custom. Mm -hmm. um, and my final question is, I mean, it sounds like you have, uh, in terms of the whole process and everything, it's, um, it's fantastic that you've chosen to apply it to manufacturing, but it sounds like you have some sort of algorithm that can have a lot of impact elsewhere. Have you considered like applying that in other derivatives in like a licensing model or something like that? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, the first continuation of our patent is, uh, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential in, you know, what you see is what you get manufacturing. Yeah. So right now you're focused on manufacturing. <laughs> well, it's, it's also the software application, you know, uh, because the patent is on the use of augmented and virtual reality, not simply as a uh, data reporting device, but as a configurator for the manufacturing. Mm. So as you're configuring the virtual object, either in a, you know, in, in an architectural setting or in a, in a repair situation for the military, that is translating into the engineering file and into the manufacturing instructions. That direct link is what, we've cr what we had patented. Okay, thank you. So in theory, you could offer that as a service to architect design firms that want to have a super high-end experience and let their customers come in and customize it all and see how things change. We're already talking with architects because uh, you know we're um, we're in discussions with a few companies that would benefit from using Revit. So using um, our technology and creating those Revit families, they can show their clients in VR, the room, and as the client is making co uh, comments, those, those products in, in the Revit environment in VR can be dynamically changed and, and, and they're already pre-constrained pre and pre-configured for manufacturing, immediate manufacturing. And so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an exciting future. What type of traction have you got with designers with architects with home builders in terms of if if you get one of those type of firms on board how many clients are they bringing you how often what what do the numbers look like if one if if a medium sized arch, uh, uh, architecture firm is building 10 buildings uh, nationwide what we offer them is uh, always local de-risked low risk manufacturing and supply of their interior case goods and if a typical building is 50,000 square feet that's got $500,000 of uh, casework you know built in cabinetry and and so it, it it scales pretty pretty rapidly and um our um supply side there is no real limit there are so many of these machines how long does it take to get a um, a builder, a designer, an architecture firm on board? What's the sales cycle look like? The uh, there's um, there it's a conservative industry, so that takes time, and that's why I'm focused on dealers because uh, dealers they're already confronting their clients' problems. They're trying to solve uh, solutions for the clients. Often the the the, the you know, the standardized size solution that cabinets come in at a reasonable price point does not solve those problems sufficiently. So we're introducing a custom, you know, at each one of our cabinets, you can order in thousands of size variants. And so that really solves a, 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 
an implementation problem for these kitchen designers, showrooms and designers and, and dealers. Understood. Awesome. Then that that's it from my side right now. Ryan Orell, any other questions for Tino? Thank you. Thanks, Tino. Awesome. Yeah. Then Tino, thank you. Uh, we we've had houses. Let's uh hmm. houses. I don't have a great transition for this, so we'll just go over to water and uh, hand things over to Aqua Alarm and Hasi. Um, do you want to you want to share what you guys are doing? Let me see. Get you all set up. Remove everybody else, and you should be able to share your screen. Let me know when you're ready, and I will start the clock, and you can take things away. Oh, you're muted right now. Are you ready, Hasi? You're still muted. Sorry. There we go. No worries. You are right. on the clock and ready to go. Thank you. So I'm Hasse Storebakken, CEO of Aqualarm. Uh, I have a long history in working with implementing sustainability models in, in safety regimes. Uh, done that for two decades. Now focusing on water and Aqualarm's mission is to safeguard uh, the drinking water, the microbial elements of it, on its journey to the tap or to an industrial recipient. So we could take the water from Dennis being brought to a fish farm and making sure it's safe. But in, in this main case right now, it's about cities and towns and bringing water from their water treatment plants to the normal consumers. And this is covering worldwide problems that are worsened a lot right now with the climate changes. Because when you make food, water is food. When you make food in large scale, you would like things to be as stable as possible so that you can fine tune and ensure quality is good. And that's not what's happening with the climate changes. We're having storms, rainfalls, we're having temperatures variations, and all these will create lots of changes and challenges. And microbial changes are dangerous. They can kill. Uh, also, clearly, we have will fires and drafts, meaning that the return systems, but also the systems basically to bring water towards the water treatment plants are stressed and that changes the situation with what is brought to the piping system and all this is happening throughout the world without any modern systematic of getting to know what is in those pipes you know it's a black box and we're opening that black box what we see as a problem is that the operational costs are increasing strongly people are getting you know gut diseases they don't know came from the water some people distrust the water and use a lot of plastic carried water and, and there's also a cyber and a security element of this we solve this and what we bring is actually Early warnings, we alert before it's a problem. We alert before there is a lot of bacteria in the water. We alert while it's it's still cheap to do something. Basically flush through more water here and it will be good. So early warnings and advice on what to do. We do this in our secret soup, which is supported by our self-made sensor using lots of customer data. And these things create a model and a prediction of how the water should be in the next second. And if there's something new, we'll tap a sample and bring it to the lab and then put that data into our model again so that the model knows for the future about that kind of fingerprint as well. So that's the basics of how we build these infos that are basically critical and useful information for those that sit in a city or a town and try to operate what's inside all these pipes. And I could also chunk up this problem. We're not now talking about what utility 
people working for the for the water utilities and or say monitoring and steering the distribution network. But if we chunk it up, it could also be about the future of water having circular water. You wouldn't only have one water quality, drinking water. You'd have uh, water coming from the loo being reused for for watering the fields. You we'll probably have 30 variants in the future. And any water that's brought through a pipe and needs to have a specific specific quality is our future. 30 seconds, just as a warning. Yep. So we do have customers that look forward like this. We do have a lot of, of traction with, with these customers. We're bringing these first products to the market next year. And we are in a smart water market process, which is doubling. So we have the wave. Software as a solution, business to business. We have a very competent uh, CTO, which is, has, his, uh, has, his, has his PhD in this and has worked with uh, large water companies and also make sure that we understand the problems. We have your hardware time, and software challenge. Yes. Your Good. time is up. I'm sorry. How much are you guys raising? One mil. One million. Thanks. For, for, uh, thank you for thank you for sharing everything. Um, I, let's hand things over now to our incredible investor panel. We'll bring Ryan and Orel back in here, and I will let Orel go first. Orel, questions for Hase and Aqua Alarm. Yes. Um, so, in terms of the sensors, where are you placing them exactly, and what types? Like, how are they produced? Are they off the shelf? Is there something unique there in terms of are you produce yeah, we, them? We, we we produce them. And uh, it depends on the problem because we deliver services that solve problems. In the water sector, you could say there are about 10 very common problems. And one of them being, for example, service reservoirs. When you hold water for a time, it creates a problem with old water, with where bacteria may grow. Very common problem, huge problem, very cheap for us to handle. We can solve, avoid those problems very cheaply. But, and that's what we're starting with next year. Whereas event response, what how to build advice takes a lot more of data uh, uh, assembly and treatment. More sensors, more costly, but also more valuable. Because if you have a problem, the, the, the customers really want to know, where did it come from? What can we do? So say you have about 10 of these services. We're starting with the simplest ones, building more and more. Um, okay, and in terms of the go-to-market, I mean, you're dealing with probably the most difficult B2G structure here. Mm. How do you manage to overcome that? I mean, for a fleeting moment, I thought I saw London on your uh, paid yep. pilots or customers, so I'd love to understand mm. how that has been working. So we will sell through channel partners, being those companies that already, say, deliver pumps, uh, pipes and some software they would want our kind of software as a part of their portfolio they will be our channel partners in the future and we have relationships with three or four of these working now with two of them to prep and improve our channel partner setups i worked with these things before in other industries i know about the challenges it takes some time but this is how we will say have world reach do you mind expanding on that a bit, the channel partner structure? Yeah. So we have a, a water partner, say, coming from Mexico and working a bit in Israel, having uh, industry selling for $2 billion presently. They do start now working with a, with a digital portfolio. They don't have what we have. We can sell, they can sell their product with ours because the two are a better combo. That's how it works. So we're talking with Sao Paulo, we're talking with Sing Singapore right now because we can do it through these. We will not be there present. We will basically support these channel partners in, in setting up the system, making sure it's working. Presently, right now, we are having all these contacts ourselves in our initial projects where we build and ensure that our algorithms, our database support is correct. We're, we're hands-on. But already from next year, channel partners will do the sales. 
So that means that your system can integrate with any existing utility provider? That's our challenge, yes. It's not easy. Okay, doesn't sound easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, I, I'm curious um, to know, you said there's no existing solution out there for this. How does how does this, how do municipalities, governments currently get data? How are they testing? Is it all manual? I mean, there's got to be some way of doing it. Um, they, they, they what take, does that look like? They take grab samples, they deliver it to a, to a laboratory to get back the answers in three to five days when the water has been consumed and when it's hopeless to really find out what happened. This is what is being done everywhere in the world. That's why we see all these uh, health problems. And uh, you know, it, it is a very weak system. And it's absolutely not in line with modern ways of producing food. Yeah, is it on the is is it just on the way to the tap, or is there also in wastewater that you're able to detect? I know in New York City is an example; they just detected uh, polio in uh, the wastewater streams. Um, mm. I assume yeah. that's similar sort of processes as, yeah. as what yeah, you just but, mentioned. But it's, it's, it's not it's doing. not it's not our scope uh, with the setup <clears throat> we have right now. We used some resources to get a very simple and cheap sensor in place that. Uh, basically counts cells so we can see a change uh, in the future we may go in different directions here but basically now it's about water in pipe and a focus on microbial situations but that will expand but we have to do got this it. business first got it so right now it's not currently detecting or maybe can you just talk a little bit about what it's currently detecting and how the tech actually mm. works or the sensor actually works when it's deployed? Yeah, it's, it's a fluorescent spectrometric sensor. It sounds complex and it is. That's why it's a little bit difficult to do this. We're the first ones doing this in this kind of scale. So it basically recognizes tryptophan, which is a part of the metabolism of any cell. And we, we count cells passing by. The cells are beamed in with a sort of light. We can read off light if, if there's a tryptophan there. And, and typically then the way that it works, and you're smarter at this than I am, but if there are a change in what it's reading, then that alerts um, the utility pro provider that, hey, there's something wrong here. Let's go then test it out manually to see. No, 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 no. Well, that's what our competitors do. And that creates a lot of mess and work for the, for the operators. You know, I don't want that. I don't want to have to hire 10 more people because I get alarms all the time. So we have a look at all the data from the customer how are the water flows? How's the water pressure? Has anything happened? Is there a reason why we see this change? If there's not, we take a, we take a sample there and then and teach our model. Our model will tell about the normal pattern throughout the, uh, throughout the full year. So if any, anything happens that is not within normal, there'll be a sample. We will investigate and the model will be updated. Got it. Okay. And then my last question is just around the business model. How much are you, is it per sensor that you're selling to utilities, municipalities, per, per, or overall contract? Per, per service. So uh, okay. typically that um, the, the water reservoir case is a fairly simple thing. We need little hardware and, and the data model is fairly simple. Whereas most customers will also want to know where did it come from? What should I do? And they will have many problems in each city sector. So typically as a one mill city, we'll have maybe 30, 40, 50 services that are buying. And each of these will be priced between 10 and 30 K dollars a year. Got it. Cool. Thank you. So you're looking at a couple of million, uh, sorry, a couple of hundred thousand to a couple of million per city then? Yes, <laughs> I, I need to calculate every time because I, I'm in knock and that's and, and mm -hmm. so I shift the comma, but yes. <laughs> and what 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 are the timelines look like for those? I know you said you're going to be working primarily with partners, but what do the timelines look like for those type of sales cycles and then implementation? Well, we have huge interest. There's a huge demand now because the, the routines are so antiquated. And if you want to bring out all the gray-haired ones and bring in new, new people, new stuff, you have to have something else. So there's a big drive for a change. So we have lots and lots of interest well, in the forward-leaning part of the industry. Uh, 
Uh, and by selling through channel partners, those that are they're used to handling with, they came with pumps and pipes before, now they come with some, something else. It's also easier. We shouldn't do that. You know, a sales, salesman they're used to and that, that I trust will do that sale. Is your model ultimately then the salesman model or have you thought about licensing the technology and letting someone else? No, we'll build? be that center that really supports all these channel partners because there's a lot of complexity in this and we have to make that simple. So that's our basic, uh, we'll, we'll have a very, very str strong competence team that makes sure there are patterns, flows, softwares that simplify this. For example, also a, a meta world where you can go in and get to test all things for, to make these big decisions. So there's, there's a lot of data support that will come into this. So it's odd that companies haven't, or that uh, cities haven't, municipalities haven't moved yet. How much of a kind of punishment is them is there for them when they get this wrong? How much does this actually cost cities? Good question. And the answer why we're working first now in the UK is that UK is one of those countries where, which are really tough on this. And we're right now also seeing an interesting move in, in South America where many countries toughen up. So they give huge penalties when, when you find bad results on the, on the lab data. So that's where we start. You know, that's where we can build our, our first uh, algorithms and databases and connect them up, make sure the models are good. Understood, understood. That's everything from my side. Hasi, anything else from you, uh, Ryan, Aurel, do you have questions or should we move on to the last startup of the night? No, thank good. You. Thank you. Thank you very much for having awesome. Me. Then thanks so much. Thanks very much for the presentation and what you're doing. I've never really thought about the water quality. I uh, I'm definitely blessed to be in uh, Switzerland now, where we have some pretty incredible tap water. You can drink out of any fountain. People look at you like you're nuts if they're from abroad, <laughs> because <laughs> and I've been in the U.S. and I wouldn't want to drink out of any of the fountains there. Um, but now uh, we're going to be handing things over to. Uh, Gerardo with uh, Recycle App. But first, before we do, uh -huh. I just want to let everyone know that the Startup Tank, if you're interested in learning more, you can find us at the startuptank.com. We're available on all major podcasting platforms. So YouTube, Spotify, Google, Apple, et cetera. You can find all of those links in the show notes or just visit the startuptank.com for links to all of those platforms. Search for us, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to actually invest in companies like this, you're an accredited investor and want to learn a little bit more about us and what we're doing at Forward, then be sure to visit Forward, the number four, ward.vc. Now I'm going to be handing things over to Amin, who's going to be pitching Recycle App, a, a cool new kind of Uber of recycling model. Um, take it away, Amin. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. We got your screen. You are on the clock. Your five minutes starts now. Perfect. Thank you. My name is Amin. Uh, we're located in Mexico. Today, we're happy and grateful to introduce Reciclab, a scalable model of waste valorization. We digitalize the circular economy. We empower homes, businesses, schools, and municipal governments to transform their waste into resources. Aligned with the SDGs, we work for a positive systemic change. So Recyclab is a recycling and composting platform for circular waste management. At Recyclab, we offer a free and intelligent recyclable and organic waste collection service for citizens, businesses, and schools so that everyone can easily recycle and compost from their own doorstep. In the current stage, we are dedicated to the collection and sale of recyclables previously sorted by our users. And we have complementary future revenue streams that we're developing, including a premium subscription for organic collection and potentially a percentage of sales for referrals of our users to green allied businesses. There is a waste crisis because little is recycled in Latin America and specifically in Mexico. Less than 4% of all waste is recycled, even though there are operating recycling plants accessible. The world market for waste management is over 400 billion dollars and as cities expand and population grows, the problem and this market will only grow. In Mexico alone, the value of recyclable waste is over $4 billion, of which more than 95% of this waste is not used and ends up in landfills. 
In this first stage of the project, our goal is to cover the entire municipality of Torreon and, uh, and continue to grow to other cities in the country. We are already working hand in hand with our municipal government, who is supporting us to scale, as it currently spends over 10% of their budget in waste management, which is over $11 million per year to borrow these valuable materials. Because here in Mexico, waste management companies uh, are incentivized to bury everything. And the more they bury, the, the more they get paid. We solve waste. With our project, up to 65% of urban solid waste can be revalued by redirecting the 50,000 tons of local uh, easily available recyclables. The municipal government of Torreon can save at least $2 million per year. Our users can recycle from home, obtain rewards and discounts, check their collection itinerary, recycling community, improve their impact, and uh, check our EC sorting guide. The service in three steps. First, visualize your collection schedule, sort your recyclables, and give it to us. Lay your burlap outside, and we'll give you a, uh, a clean one. 75% of our users always recycle weekly, and 95% at least, at least once a month. And for organic waste, a recycle a premium. One year after our pilot tests, our users continue to recycle with us. They showed us that they recycle to help, to help the environment, not for economic incentives. The results of our pilot test gave us the award for, our, uh, for the first place in Greenpreneurs 2021. We're just starting, but growing quickly. We have over uh, 165 users, two businesses allied with us, uh, one school and the municipal government. We have over 400 uh, household users in waitlist and seven schools. We make the projections to year three based on the metrics obtained. Our churn rate is 0.11% uh, per month. This means that client that we acquired, client that remains. As it is a new basic service, we're facing a blue market where we expect to grow aggressively. This market has the advantage, advantages of the economics of scale that once acquired, this tends to behave as a monopoly for each municipality in which a waste management strategy is implemented. Only for from recyclables sold from each household, we obtain the equivalent of $4 per month in average, businesses $15, schools and government around $50. The climate impact uh, for uh, the net, according to the APA, the net emission reduction of recycling uh, and composting is uh, compared to landfill recycle or uh, landfill disposal. I mean, uh, for organics is 10 times less emissions by composting instead of being sent to landfill. And from uh, recyclable sent to landfill, uh, it's uh, by recycling, it's 2.94 uh, times less emissions. The uh, CO2 uh, equivalent mitigation in Torreon Coahuila. Uh, of this project is projected at over 200,000 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So we envisioned a world with Reciclab's circular waste management uh, by us, uh, promoting and sustaining economic growth without sacrificing our natural resources. By 2030, 2035, uh, we want to transform half of the waste in Mexico. Time is up. I am sorry. Thank I you. Mean, how much are you guys racing? We're raising uh, three hundred thousand uh, dollars for our seat. Three hundred thousand. Let's bring in our investor panelists, our sharks, so to speak, and open it up for questions. Thank you. Gerardo will be joining us for the questions. Yes. Hello. I think it's Ryan's turn to go first. My turn to go first? All right. Go for um, it. <clears throat> thanks. So that was a great presentation. I appreciate you walking us through that. I'm curious um, how you're solving the problem of the processing of the recyclable materials. It sounds like you're focusing first on the sort of the com consumer side, collecting it and then getting it. But as you mentioned up front in your pitch, 2.2% of cities have a formal recycling program. Are you helping them implement some of the facilities? Are you taking it to a centralized location? Or are you handling that? How are you? Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you a lot, Ryan. Um, actually, uh, so there's a solid, robust uh, recycling industry in Mexico. 
So otherwise, we co we collect this these uh, recyclables and get them to recycle. We sell them uh, to these recycling centers, and actually, we are uh, by working with government, they are using our database to uh, know the state of art of recycling because otherwise, there is no inform little to no information about it. Um, pretty much in the case in Latin America, everything goes to landfill. Like you could see in Europe and in the United States, there's a decent uh, the recycling rate. But otherwise, everything pretty much goes into landfill in, in Latin America. So, yeah, we just, there's the, the industry, we, we get it there. Got it. So is, is your focus then, uh, kind of switching gears a little bit, is your focus on, it sounds like you're both B2C and B2B. How are you anticipating, uh, you know, from experience that it's challenging to scale both of those? Are you expecting that you're going to see more effort um, on the B2C side of things, signing up households, or do you see there's more traction in going after businesses um, to help them? Yeah, thank you, Ryan, again. And it's really interesting because waste, as we understand it, it's uh, an issue that affects all of us, everything within the system. Um, and thus the, the, the core business, the, the corporations we have, we are carrying out, it's practically the same. So yeah, we understand businesses have, uh, perhaps they, they make more as, as schools are, but in essence, it's the same. We go, we collect and we get it back. We just uh, either, for households, small bags, uh, reusable bags, and for businesses, our local government and um, and schools as institutions, like super big bags. And once they're filled out, we go and replace them. It's a super easy method we have. And government, even uh, I mentioned uh, the B2G, because the government is super interested in, in us being um, uh, profitable by ourselves because uh, they are paying around $40 per, per ton of um, collected waste and disposed at landfills. And we would uh, reinject this, this, this value into the economy while charging, the, while charging them less or nothing at all. Got it, okay. And then my last question is just around the logistical and sort of operational aspects of the business. How are you, as you scale and, and you know, obviously the quality control on a localized level when you're working with one, one municipality is fairly easy, but how do you anticipate as you scale and grow into other locations, geographies, um, able to continue to sort of support the infrastructure um, yeah. of, of what you're doing? Yeah, thanks again, Ryan. Um, we talked this with um, Chris, uh, Chris Dodd Do from Dallas Capital. Like, it seems like our, our upfront cost is high or to replicate. Um, we can is, is, is scale the, the business through our technology, through the usage of the app. Uh, we have many users and, and it helps us because we have been, for instance, uh, to get our business users that offer the discounts at the marketplace, there's like a, a chamber of commerce of where they are all reunited and uh, governments, we are currently uh, operation, with operations in Torreón Covila, but otherwise we have already worked with uh, San Pedro, which is Monterrey, Nuevo León. Um, see, we have got into touch with Sinaloa and they all pretty much face the same problems, which is uh, waste management. Um, so our this $300 is for us to scale to, uh, to one tenth of all the recyclables in our city, Torreon. Torreon has 700,000 inhabitants and population. And by presenting, by achieving the result we want, um, we would uh, scale and replicate the, the our, we, we would plan on replicating and scale on pro, our project um, by uh, negotiating with, the, all, with these other governments with the results we would uh, prove in Torreon. Great, thanks. Um, I have a question. I'm interested to know what's your background and how did you get into this uh, sector? Here's a funny one. I sorry. Um, we met back in back in high school. Um, back in high school, every one of us, um, well, four of us co-founders met in back in high school. Uh, one of them met. We I met with him in in university. Where he's um, 
we started actually first our startup Hexabiotech. We were awarded the, the first uh, prize in sustainability in Latin America by the UN, by the IFAD. Uh, we work first uh, with organic waste stream, turning it into upcyclable. We, we upcycled it thanks to insect technology. And that's uh, in within a roadmap to merge the logistics we have developed with uh, Reciclab uh, to gather all the waste from um, households, schools, businesses, government, and to treat, uh, manage all of these recyclables and later on carry out our operations like uh, big operations with organic waste. So we have been committed to sustainable development since 2019 that we started operations. We've been worked uh, together ever since, and um, we, we've been keeping on, on adding um, people that believe in, in making a change, and we, can, we found a great opportunity in waste. Okay. Um, you briefly, I mean, I just saw like a split second, it said that um, part of the freemium model is organic waste, that they can pay like $4 extra. And, uh, yeah, that's the, pre the, the, the premium model. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, yeah. yeah so, premium for about it's um calculated premium about uh, four dollars in average because uh, we are not charging them, and uh, the premium about uh, ten dollars more. Month. So, in terms of your business model, I think like organic waste. I think the solution there is just a lot more obvious in terms of farmers, and I think there could be like quite healthy margins there. So. Can you just walk me through where that goes? What kind of local relationships you've developed and so on? Yeah, so um, as it goes, the freemium model is the recyclables. Basically, the, the users are not paying us. It's free of, free of charge. But mm -hmm. what we collect in um, recyclable materials, what it's worth, is it, it, that's worth about $40 per month. There is a competitor that gathers organic waste. Uh, they're called Dagamos Composta. They charge each user like four dollars per week uh, to manage their organic waste. So we're um, envisioning the of charging users less for, uh, uh, well, start charging them for organic waste, which would be less than, than traditional composting because uh, with insects, we can eat uh, the, the waste stream in, in two weeks. Um, and how does how do we envision it would carry out? So we're starting to carry out heavily uh, on recyclable waste. And as we envision it, we envision like one tenth of what we collect would be organic. So we would start by limiting our organic connection or organic waste collection um, and carry out our tests or pilots. And then we could just, uh, depending on how it goes, right? Uh, collect recyclables and, and organic by, by, say, by the same. But first we, we so that's on, on a roadmap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. How do you how do you avoid a, a race to the bottom or a, a cash land grab? So you kind of have local network effects. You're gonna need the pickers or the the garbage collectors or recycling collectors. You need the municipalities. You you have in a lot of ways a similar or comparable model to what happened with Uber with ride sharing. The, the, yes. you can kind of run into a market put a bunch of money into getting drivers or in this case recyclers on board but well if i'm a recycler if someone else is paying more i'm going to switch the app and if i'm a municipality if something else is costing less i'm going to switch to them how do you deal with what where's your defensibility um, actually, Matt, thank you, thank you a lot for, for that question. First of all, we would like to recognize the, the, the labor or the work of, of, of waste pickers. Um, they actually, they are the national recycling heroes. Uh, they collect more than 70% of what's recycled nationwide. Um, first of all, they are in the situation that they have to, uh, since they don't have any syndicated, any, uh, they just sell to whoever pays them the best. And then these centers, they later, later on sell them to bigger ones in which you can imagine they are just getting a, a, a huge cut, a huge, uh, just for doing nothing basically. And so at Resi Club, we carry out our own collection. We plan on, on opening our, our centers uh, to buy uh, these waste pickers, their waste, the best available price in the market because it doesn't affect us. 
and it doesn't affect us and it and it affect them positively as they will get a, a better a better price and the first trials uh we have carried them out in gated neighborhoods which doesn't really affect the share uh the market share because these gated neighborhoods they don't allow anyone i, I mean they they need like a special um, authorization to to go in, inside of the the neighborhood that's that's on, on on that part and uh the second part that i wanted to say uh, about the market share was um could you remind, remind me uh, what was the second part you're you're mute just in terms of the defensibility you have so one was the actual oh, yeah business how how much money you make and it seems like it could be a race to the bottom and then the other side yeah. was the defensibility yeah okay so on that part uh we're creating allies so the household the businesses the schools and the government are uh, we're envisioning um uh mechanisms to all uh, to for them to become allies with us for instance at schools we're developing right now uh, as we speak um Circular economy, uh, sustainable development, uh, yeah, uh, sustainable development, uh, leadership and entrepreneurship for schools, for like workshops, workshops for us to provide for all the students, so we can create leaders inside the schools. And after uh, um, after profit, we're gonna dedicate well, around forty percent uh, profit for them, like a, for a small school, for a school fund in which they can spend it to. Uh, uh, school trips, uh, competences, etc. That's the model we have been working uh, with the local government. We're dedicating around 40% of our profits after uh, our margins after profit to um, in, 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 the, in the government case, we're dedicating it to uh, like um, basic um, food items for, for the cleaning personnel. Um, for Businesses are gonna choose us. Yes, there's obviously the, the money, the, the money tag, money price. But rather, we're creating this marketplace in which they have a new uh, sales channel, a new revenue opportunity for them to screen uh, for them these businesses to screen uh, to all the users, the house users we have. And at the same time, we're gonna promote them like uh, environmental marketing for them because they're choosing the 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 the, the most um, responsible option towards the waste. And users simply, it's they're, we're giving them. We found out that it's they're doing it for the environmental and social aspects, but we're gonna price them with a uh, economic discounts at the businesses as well. Understood. One follow up: Did you say you were donating forty percent of the profits? Uh, after yeah, that that's uh, at the scale of. of the municipal government that's uh pretty much what we have found uh for them to give them so they can carry out um mm, for the cleaning personnel but this is on a basis that we haven't um this is on a basis of uh certain floors so so the the, the government institution the city hall it has like like seven floors um in Torrenco Villa. And we're only dealing with the with certain floors with the recyclables we obtain from from the workers of, of those floors. Like it has not been implemented to to all of it. At the same time, the prices we gave uh, what we collect from schools, it's not the entire school. It's it has been only from from okay. some I, I understood. I thought you said you were donating forty percent of the profit from the entire business. Oh no 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 no. Okay, yeah. understood. Understood. Yeah. That makes that makes more. You're you would have a very hard time being a venture scale yeah. yeah. company yeah. then. Yeah. Any um, I think that's everything from me. I uh, I uh, Ryan or Rel, do you guys have other questions that you would want to ask for Recycle App? Recycle Club. Recycle App. Yeah, Recycle Recycle Recycle. Nope, all good. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Then this is the time in the program where we transition things over to startup of the night. We bring our panelists back in. So that's Ryan, Orell, and myself. And we discuss who we think is the most promising company. Who are we most excited about either investing in, setting up a meeting with, or where we see the largest overall potential. I, um, I, th this is really if we had the funds to pour into all of the companies here, we would love to do that. But sometimes you've got to pick winners and this is venture and well, winners win big. So let's see who, who do we think are the, who do we think are the big winners here? You want to go first again, Aurel? 
Yeah, sure. So um, personally, I actually, first of all, I just want to say thank you <laughs> to all the founders that are here. Um, it's really, really admirable that everyone, you know, is taking their time and dedicating it towards these initiatives that, as you can see, are so diverse. There are so many ways of addressing the climate issue. And um, it really is humbling to be able to speak to you all. Um, but on that note, I was particularly impressed by two um, panelists. Why not? Um, first being uh, Baru, which I think they're doing oh. something really incredible, including many different spheres you want some uh, uh, manufacturing, um, just clearly also technology that can be echoed into other um, realms. So, them, as well as Bio. Um, so, um, I was very the... good to guys comment on energy poverty, and it seems like there's a real gap there um in latin america and i think what they say they they can do can give a lot of people um what we all take for granted and also like specifically the SaaS platform that he said that um they have um can teach people how to develop sustainable habits when it comes to energy and uh, mindful habits so i was also very impressed by that um and yeah, thank you so much again. I'd love to hear what you guys thought as well. Yeah, th thanks for sharing. I was super impressed by both companies as well. Ryan, do you wanna you wanna share your picks? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, uh, thanks, Matt, for having me on. And Aurel, great to be uh, on this with you. I think um, you know, strong sentiment here that all of these solutions need to exist and need to come to market. And really impressed and inspired by what you all are building. Um, you know, I think me and Aurel and Matt, our job is here to just support you. You are all on the front lines of this. And so kudos to you to, to being in this fight um, and, and bringing these solutions to market. Um, I, I'm obviously a, a bit biased here. Um, I put my, my money where my mouth is and invested in carbon yield. So I obviously have to, uh, have to put them first. I, I wouldn't be able to have any meetings with them if I didn't. Uh, so Sam and Claire, I, I think what they're doing at Carbon Yield is transformative in terms of bringing um, uh, new innovative agricultural solutions to market and helping us move towards more regenerative uh, markets overall. And I think that's that's hugely needed in this space. Um, uh, but outside of the context of, of my bias there, I think BioEasel, uh, what Felipe is doing uh, in terms of energy storage, um, and helping to transition um, the Latin American market, but I think the potential there is pretty strong elsewhere um, is, is uh, significant and a uh, big fan of what they're uh, doing uh, as well. And really interested and keen to see how Aqua Alarm as well sort of scales up their potential. Uh, I think there's a huge amount of, of, of need there. Uh, I think it's an under uh, utilized or underseen market and, and excited to see what they bring to market. But um, those are sort of my, my thoughts and um, I'll pause there because everybody here is doing great things. And my three-year-old also just joined because he wants to say hi and vote, but um, no, I've got no my, worries. My we're all, we're all used Thank to that. You. I, I need to jump off soon. My, my four-year-old just finished with daycare. It was the last day. And now we're going on to Kinski. So we're celebrating tonight. So I want to make sure that we wrap up with a, an awesome choice for startup of the night. I would say my thoughts were pretty well echoed by the two of you. So I was really impressed by BOE Soul and what they've managed to accomplish so far. 700K in, in uh, run and ARR is not bad at all. They're, they're moving fast. Uh, the challenges I saw are potentially on the margin side of that and transitioning over to that energy as a service model. I really liked what Baru is doing in terms of, I mean, man manufacturing is broken if we build it on one side of the world and move it over to the other side of the world. Something's just not working right there. And I, mm -hmm. like, the, I like the access capacity that they're taking up using and turning it to something valuable. Carbon yield, I would say, is kind of a wild card for me. That one's that one I was pretty excited about, but I think it's a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit further down the road. And then the same would be true for all of the other companies as well. Those aren't totally in our wheelhouse. So I think I think for us, I would I would go between either Baru or BioEsol, and then given a uh, given Ryan's feedback albeit biased feedback, I think we'll have to go with, uh, I, I would go with bio ESOL if you guys were, if you guys were game. Yeah. With a close runner up of Baru. Does that sound, does that sound fair, fair to everybody here? Do you think that's a good, good pick? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Awesome. Then, Mr. Felipe, let me give you the, the mic if you want to say a few words. Well, uh, thank you all for, for your kind words and obviously your support. Uh, well, looking forward to have the opportunity to meet in, in a close uh, meeting. Uh, well, uh, let's, let's sit back to it. I like it. I like it. Thanks for pitching. Thank you to everyone who presented tonight. You guys did an incredible job. You're doing an incredibly important job and an incredibly hard job. It's not an easy one. There's a lot of easier ways to, to build a business to be successful. Um, Ryan Orwell, if people want to find you, learn more about you and what you do, where's the best place for them to do that? Ryan, you can go first this time. We've done enough ladies first. It's your turn. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, thanks again. My, my email is ryan at generator.com. Uh, uh, it's generator with an eight um, and happy to connect um, with everybody. And uh, yeah, excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing some incredible insights. Aurel? Uh, sure. So on LinkedIn, Aurel Khalili or by email, aurel.k at capitalnature.com. And Matt, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was really, really fun. And thanks for both of you guys for coming on and moderating this panel, having helping hopefully these companies get a little bit more insight into what they need to raise and build something serious. Um, if this is your first time, if this is your last time, it better not be your last time. But if it is, or if you haven't subscribed, the startuptank.com, you should subscribe on YouTube, the startuptank.com slash YouTube, hit that little subscribe bell to make sure, make sure you don't miss a thing. I'm your host, Matt Ward. I'm syndicate lead uh, of our climate syndicate at forward vc with a four so forward.vc we invest in companies that move the world forward haha <laughs> i get it and the the startup tank if you want to learn more about us the startup tank.com and all of this has been brought to you guys by leva the best way to set up a fast cheap easy spv where you don't have to deal with lawyers you can do secondaries you can do follow-on transactions all without setting up another spv or all the incredibly Cumbersome paperwork that goes into it. Forward.vc slash Leva. That's L-E-V-A for more details. And until next time, yeah, all the founders here, go raise some money and build a, build a better world. Investors, find some great companies and subscribe to the Startup Tank. I got to run. I will talk to you all of you later. And thanks for tuning in. Cheers.